came off a Chinook, linked up with your man. He patted me on the back, gave me a load of kit, said a few words, and that was him on the back of the Chinook, and they were away again. Continuation, continuation training is a mixture, as I said before, of uh, becoming more aware of the, uh, the, the tactical part of becoming a Special Forces soldier. And let's just say, you, you get involved in some serious stuff. People are dying. The most important thing is your own weapon. Nick, I just think we should come on. Um, I've done this, put the cart before the horse, but when you were in 2-3, can you give us an idea of, of continuation training that you do and also operations? Did you, did you go into the Middle East, for example? Yeah, so I went, yeah, I did a couple of um, operations with them. As I say, I was only in for about four or five years, so it's kind of really kind of short time for me. But um, so I did a couple of operations with them. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the obvious places that you just mentioned there. Um, you know, you, you insert by a Hilo, um, get dropped off out, out, out um, and then cross cross deck over what your specific job was for that for those um, for those locations that I worked in. It was I was like there. The, uh, the radio man, so I did as a signaler, and uh, the strange one was actually that the, the guy that I came off, it was black and white with all MVG'd up and all that lot, so quite exciting as, you know, a young lad just getting in SF and that, um, came off a Chinook, linked up with your man, he patted me on the back, gave me a load of kit, said a few words, and that was him on the back of the Chinook, and they were away again. And many years later, uh, one of the lads in one of my vehicles, um, unfortunately, succumbed to a tank mine that we drove over and it kind of just devastated the car but I was lucky enough to get out and we were in a contact as well so it was quite a challenging situation. Um, when, I, when I took the body back to uh, one of the locations, the guy that was there that took the body for me that worked for the same company was him in fact. So when we were sat outside having a fag um, waiting to go and re-ID the body, the, the body again for Gav, um, he said, oh, he served in two, three and that, yeah, 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 done any ops, yeah, done this one, done that one. We have a bit of, I'm chucking around a few dits and stuff. And he said, oh, you were there, were you? And he went, when were you there? And I went, oh, I was there with so-and-so. And he went, I, I was there then. And we established that that handover in the dark of night at the back of the Chinook was actually him, <laughs> strange enough. Um, but yeah, moving on to like continuation. Continuation training is a mixture, as I said before, of... Uh, becoming more aware of the, uh, the the tactical part of becoming a special forces soldier, um, uh, and and all that that involves. That's essentially what what that part of the course is about. Mm. And uh, are you getting to fire lots of different. I mean, do you fire sort of nine millimeter pistols and 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 automatic? What what do you call? Sorry, what word I'm looking for? Like. Uh, Uzis, that type of weapon. If you fire everything, uh, to be fair, um, yeah, you, you, you just fire, fire pretty much everything. Machine, machine pistol was the word I was looking for, wasn't it? Yeah. So you, so you, you fire everything, and you, you kind of establish, you know, what rounds uh, essentially kind of fit what weapons, so that you can you can explore when you're going into like a war zone, for example. If I was working in the Middle East, like I was Baghdad and. Afghan and all that lot, you pick up a weapon there, you know, you'd know that a 7.62 would fit that weapon, a 5.56 wouldn't, for example, you know, so so it's just having a little bit of a better understanding about that, not that you need to be a ninja or the weapons, but for example, if you were going to a, a location where they use these types of weapons, you would learn a little bit more about those weapons, so if you had to um, use it or or understand it, or you know, where the safety catches are and how it works, etc. So it's a real basic kind of level of uh, of, of um, looking at all the different types of foreign weapons and stuff. The most important thing is your own weapon and the carriage of your own weapon systems that you're going to be using. Um, like we say, you know, I was only in two three, so I didn't have the luxury of doing some of the other stuff that two two do, and so the weapon systems were um, that we then used on operations were specific to those operations and not like house clearances and stuff like that that maybe they'd use the mp kind of series weapons and stuff it must be 
different as well because if you go into combat with two three and let's just say you you get involved in some serious stuff people are dying or you're you're having to 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 kill people you you don't then go back to a regiment that all lives on the same camp or all serves on the same camp you've got to go back to civilian life where you're not surrounded by these these mates and uh you kind of are because you <clears throat> if, if you're in two three and you're doing something like that you signed on so you've got full-time reserve service you sign on for like maybe a three-year engagement or an 18 months in gaming same as same as anything else if you're a reserve soldier in the army and you were called up they would say look we're going to go and do an operation in afghanistan um we're going to do an eight-week build-up package and so they would sign you on. You'd go through all your medicals and bits and bobs. Then you'd do an eight-week build-up package. Then you'd go on operations. And then you'd come back off operations. And then you'd have a bit of a deload, wouldn't you? And then you would, like, have all your briefings and you'd have a bit of a wind-down from it. And then you'd probably sign back off again. Okay. Two or three months later, you might then get, um, get called up for something else. But within that time, you own courses. You're doing your DEMS course. I did my SFCT. I did my demolitions course. Um, so there's lots going on. And so for a special forces soldier, I think a, 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 it's, it's a misconception that, you know, you're just a TA soldier and do weekend Wednesdays. I think it used to be like that before I went in there. And even to a certain extent, a little bit like that when I joined up, because I did my selection over nine weekends and then going down and doing test weeks and stuff like that. But um, now it's a lot different. And so, you know, the expectations are that you might have a life and you might have a job, but it, you probably won't have it for much longer, or if you do, it has to be very flexible and fit in with that. Yes, got you, got you. Right, now let's come and talk about some non-military stuff. Well, yes. maybe maybe it's got, we'll, maybe we'll cross deck a little bit, but um, <clears throat> yeah, fitness, it's, I was never a, like the fit guy when I was in the military. I, I struggled with running massively. Speed marching, uh, I think just for the fact when you're smaller, I mean, I joined training, I was probably less than 10 stone. I'm only weighed 10 and a half stone now. Wow. And if I was to do a bit of a water fast next week, which I think I'm going to, that would go down to nine and a half stone. Um, and when you're, when you're that slight of build, even even wearing heavy footwear like military boots is is a strain on your body lifting lifting your legs up. And I mean, you never when you think in terms of military fitness, you never stop to think about something like boots. But it's huge. Yes. I've even got these lightweight black running boots now. I, I wore them when I did the <clears throat> when I led the um, nine mile speed march for the veterans not long ago. And even wearing them, the next day, all, all your sort of um, the top of your thighs, I can't remember the name of that muscle group, but it really, yeah. what, what is the name of that muscle? When you're cycling, you can stretch it as well. At, at the top of your thigh, the, the bit that lifts your leg, really, not... Hip flexor. Yes, the flexors, exactly. Um, even that gets sore. So... I found it quite hard going at 18 years old to be cracking out nine miles speed marches and 30 milers with all with, with all the gear. But the difference is probably between me and a lot of people, Nick, is I I've always continued the fitness. So I might not have been very good, but I've always done it off and on. I mean, I probably I might have gone for five years at one point without going for a run, probably during my sort of let's call it my party phase of life um yes that is a euphemism friends that are chuckling at home um but it what i'm getting to it means that now at 52 i did a quadruple ironman distance triathlon i ran the length of the country carrying 15 kilos or up to 15 kilos, um, again, running ultra marathon every day. I ran 200 miles around a running track and then 100 miles in the nature, all, all of which I did, I think, in six, 
five or six days. Mm. So, and I run every day because I absolutely love the, the spiritual side of it. You know, it just takes me to a, a really good place in the morning, ready to face the day. So I've come to it all a bit late, but it means that my fascination with it has developed late as well, hmm. which is why it's great to have this conversation. So let's just start off with a common denominator then. So if I was to be on a running track in trainers and asked to go balls out and try and do a mile, uh, that's 1.6 kilometres for our metric friends. Um I reckon if I had to, I could probably do that in about set between seven and seven and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 would your pace be at the moment, Nick? Oh, I don't know. I could probably do that in. Uh... Don't you? Don't, you could, don't have to be humble or anything. If you can do it in five minutes, just I'm just fascinated to know. Yeah, it's probably close to that now, actually. But that's a more recent thing because I'm invested in speed because since I did those, those world records, I lost all my speed. So it's been a struggle to get up to that. But um, So you could do it in about five minutes? Five and a bit, I would have thought, yeah. Actually, five and a half. I, I said seven and a half, didn't I? No, what I, I, meant, I meant about four and a half. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah, and you're, you're, quite a good, you're quite a good runner and you're light, aren't you? I think when I do my one mile... Efforts at the moment, yeah, they'll be about 5.15s, 5.20s maybe. See, this is the thing. I, I could only dream of that speed. I mean, honestly, I, I, is it that I've got small lungs or something? Do, do, no, no, it's just about um, practising to, to increase that by doing 400s and 600s and 800s and then doing like 0.5 of a mile um, at what you've just said then. <clears throat> and building up to that, doing 0.5 mile at a progressive pace, as in working very hard, so that when you finish that 0.5 a mile, you're at about 88%, which is your efficient range to build lactate threshold. Then drop it back down to like an efficiency rate for half a mile, and then build that up over time. So that eventually, for example, if you want a good 10 mile speed for Paris 10 or, or whatever you're doing, or a good half marathon speed, in a perfect world, you should maybe have built up to doing three miles on one mile efficiency pace, three miles on, one mile efficiency pace, and doing that for a rotation of maybe three, that's 12, 13 miles in total. But you're teaching your body not just to be fast by going through the 400s and 600s and 800s and progressing to this, but also recovering at pace, at your efficiency pace. So that when could you, you... Could you explain that in layman's terms? What does that actually, so what does that actually mean? Well, it's about just investing in your speed work and having a plan of action over an extended period of time. No, I mean, does, is what, what you're saying, like you run 400 metres fast and you rest for 100 or something? Or you'd start, We have like an, we have RTG groups within Elite Outdoor Fitness, remote training groups. And so I do all this for them, but it's group led and we're all online. We fill out a document together and we've got WhatsApp groups and we're all chatting about it every day. Uh, like today, after this, I've got to go and do my session. And everybody else will be doing the same session, but at reduced level for basic or basic plus or intermediate advanced. And so, for, for example, the speed work might be for a basic compared to the advanced. It might be um, five times 400s, but only working at about 85%. Because what you'll find is if you don't do a lot of speed work, maybe you don't do a lot of speed work, your higher heart rate ranges won't be open to you. So you'll only, you know, when you're taxing yourself for 86%, it will feel, your perception will feel, God, that is so hard. And I can only do it for that extended period of time. Whereas if you work with your speed work, your VO2 max and your lactate threshold, that's the basics of fitness, will increase. And you'll start being, just like we discussed about selection and how the mind works as well, your body is exactly the same. It will start to get very comfortable at being uncomfortable. So I'll give you an example of that is at the moment when I'm at the end of my 400s, I get to about 94% of my maximum heart rate. And I've established what my maximum heart rate is as well, which is obviously very important. So when I went and won the fan dance, I think it was last year or the year before, um, I, I normally work it as one of the DSPs there, but I asked Ken that I wouldn't mind wasting it just to see if I've still got it. And, and I won it, thankfully. Um, I spent about two hours of the 304 or whatever I got time um, above 90% of my maximum heart rate. B 
because I'd invested over an extended period of time before that, working my heart rate range higher and higher and higher. And once I got it into those ranges, I extended the time that I was working at that high range. If you don't do any speed work and you're good at distance runner, because I expect that is, that's probably about where you are, I would imagine, just making an assumption. You'd, you'd, um, you'd benefit hugely from just doing a very achievable set of 400s. And then, you know, if you say, well, but, but my, my no, I, I want to be fast for 10 miles, or you might be wanting to be fast for 5K. You don't need to be doing three miles on, four mile off at the end if you want to just be fast for five, 5K. You want to be doing something that facilitates the changes and, and the, the efficiencies that you need to go fast straight off the bat for five kilometers. What's that? 3.2 miles or something like this. Um, and so that would include some doing like 400, 600, 800, and then maybe even including some jump squats and in, in between your recovery as well, because that facilitates the type of reaction that your muscles need to generate that, that twitch and the muscle fibers that are needed to project you forward. And also once you start doing a 5K run, it's relentless, it's never ending, isn't it? It's probably the hardest run you can do in that sense, because straight from the start line it doesn't you don't warm into it it's just you're right up there and you just have to hold it for four and a half k pretty much so depending on what anybody's wanting to do it's very achievable i think what most people get wrong when they're looking at fitness is they don't understand what fitness is luckily for me you know i did sports science i did nutrition at university as well i was a pti in the army and and thankfully as well i went and did special forces which as we've discussed in this to take me to the depths right in the hole and yet I've had to keep going and going. And so I've learned so much about my body. And so I think if you went and did sports science or you were a physiotherapist or something like that, and you use that understanding at a scientific level to train people, I think you're missing something. They tend to miss something. If you took it from a manual and said, oh, it says you're supposed to do lactate threshold training like this or VO2 max training like this, I think you're missing something out. What I do is I use a part of that and I use a part of uh, my SF stuff and also all my experiences. And I seem to get, it's having that mixture of those experiences that seems to work quite well, not only for me, but all the people that we train. And most importantly, it's where you start. Most people have no idea where to start when they start getting fit and they just go out and they start training. And they're not utilizing the amounts of time that they're training each week to kind of maximize the benefits. So you're going to train for three hours a week. You might as well get three hours of good training out of it and make those efficiencies. Yeah, tell, tell me something then, Nick, because. What I do notice is um, I do get tired in the afternoons from my morning run. And I only run, I only do about 5K. So my run's about three miles. Um, it is up, as I said, up the steepest hill where I live. It's quite a, quite a monster hill. It goes on and on. Um, and I do notice if I really push the pace up the hill, then I'm more tired in the afternoon. It's, is this an age thing or, or is, this, is this normal for everyone or is this something I might be missing in my, my nutrients? Probably a number of things, really. Do you do the same type of running every day, five days a week? Pretty much I do the same run. So what efficiencies are you making? You're not really. You're just ticking over, aren't you, at that level? Yeah. So when yeah. you're yeah. working a bit harder, you're, just getting a, you're, just get, you're working a bit harder. Um, I don't think age has to come into it. You know, some of the stuff that's happening and uh, some of the people that are winning some extraordinary kind of uh, times on Paris 10 and, you know, I won it and I got a 122. Somebody's done a 116. It's a good, you know, it's a motivator, isn't it, to look at some of the people that are winning stuff like this. I did a, a fair one down here the other day and it came 32nd and I think I'm relatively fit and strong. And I was, after people were like in their 50s and 60s that were in front of me. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good motivating factor. All I would say with you is mix your training up a little bit, you know, because you're probably doing very same as training. If you look at the real basics of it, Chris, you look at um, training from 60% all the way up to 100%. You're, you're, if you can manage that process of going, right, okay, well, one day I can train at this level and then that level, but where do you start? Elite Outdoor Fitness do that. So for example, if you want to start somebody training, go, look, you know, you're 27 stone and, and we've got plenty of people that are very overweight or they've had hip replacements or coming back from cancer when they're in remission or had heart issues and stuff like that. And I think this is where we're kind of, you know, we have our proudest moments really is by taking people like that and saying, right, this is where to start. You know, where do you start? Do you want them to get fit? No, not initially. I want to start working their heart and their stroke volume. You know, their one beat stroke volume. And you can't, 
you won't make any more efficiencies above 60% of your maximum heart rate. So there's no point going out and training above 60%. So in actual fact, you could start somebody off and walking and they would make huge benefits over an extended period of time just with their heart, their stroke volume, rather than getting them running where their heart stroke volume is struggling a little bit and they're trying to lose weight and they've got little niggles and issues with their ankles and their hips and because they're overweight and you're trying to get them to run. You start at 60%. And as you progress through, you start kind of going to the ranges of like a little bit more. So if you break training down, very simply, you've got um, 65 to 75%, which is uh, recovery and LSD type stuff, where you build your mitochondria, which is the powerhouses where all your energy is in your cells, in your muscle cells. And that's really important to build. And that's probably what you're very good at doing, actually, with your, some of the stuff that I've seen that you've done. And then 75 to 82%, that's your efficiency range. range. So although you're making efficiencies in all that area there, when you're working at 100%, you're not making the heart stroke volume at 60% of your maximum effort. You're not making those efficiencies that much at all because you're, you're working at 100% only for like 10 seconds. Whereas if you're running at 65% of your maximum heart rate for like 18 miles, you're not really kind of using your explosive power. You're not really kind of... Um, delving into to other elements. But when you work between 75 and 82% of your maximum heart rate, you're hitting all of them. And that's probably where you're at because it feels very comfortable working between 75 and 82%. And you're making lots of good efficiencies when you're just ticking over. But 82 to 88% is where all the golden stuff is. That's where all the changes are made. That's where you start to increase your VO2 max and, 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 uh, and your lactic threshold. So this is part of the reason, Nick, that I run up the biggest hill. So first mile is a gentle sort of jog downhill, a bit a bit flat and then a bit down. Then it's up this monster hill for the middle mile. And then it's almost completely flat all the way home. And the reason I opt for that, I used to just jog around the block and I loved it, but I got so quick at it, it wasn't worth it just wasn't worth going it wasn't worth putting my trainers on so i've upped it to the three and the reason i like that middle hard mile is it's not just a cruise is it it's not just a three mile jog around the local area it's it's there's a i'm i guess what i'm trying to say is i'm i figure i'm really putting my heart rate up by running that and you and you probably are but if you if you run that uh monday wednesday friday this week and said, I'm gonna work quite hard at this to see what kind of sub, maybe just slightly sub uh, race pace, to see what time, average minute mile pace, which includes the hills and everything. And you've got a bit of a, you know, steam on as it were. And maybe you ran it at, I don't know, eight and a half minute mile pace overall on average. I would argue that if you just for two weeks broke it down. So for example, you go out and you do your run and you do a warming up phase. So for example, on one part of the week, you just go out and run. You don't include the hill or anything like that. You just go and do a nice, easy recovery run. And you make sure that you stick between 65 and 75%. That's that one done, boxed away. And then the next one, you go and do hill reps. So you go and warm up a little bit and then you select one of those hills and you might like nail it up for like 30 seconds. And then you might do three minutes and you mix it up a little bit, quite possibly, um, so that you're doing those hill reps and you're only focused on hill reps and recovery. You're recovering at the top and you're running down and you're also getting to the top of the hill and continuing your effort on the flat. So you get that muscle transition and you box that one away and you do that one another time. And then the latter part of your run, you say it kind of goes quite flat. And I would imagine you would like to pick up a good quality pace because if you're running that flat bit at the end of your three miles and you're running a nine minute mile pace, it'd be nice to feel the same kind of exertion, but you run an eight minute mile pace because that's fitness, that's lactic threshold training. So what you could do is you could do two, 400s and uh, sets of 400s, like starting with six 400s and then doing seven 400s and eight 400s and trying to keep the same pace as you originally were doing your six 400s in on average. And I would say that if you did that for a couple of weeks and then you went back and did your Monday, Wednesday and Friday tests, you'd be a lot fitter. You'd be a lot faster over that period of time and you'd feel stronger as well. But what you're doing at the moment is you're not really making many efficiencies because you're not breaking those down that's the real basics of it i'm just basically staying in my comfort zone is that what we're saying well a little bit it's great you know you can you can go and do that run like here's quite flat i have to run to the hills uh, for like three and a half four miles to get to the hills and then start doing all that but i would certainly say that if you are very specific in your training you can train one day and you can train hard but you're actually recovering at the same time from another element uh, another system 
So you've got loads of systems and you're taxing them at all at different levels. Ah, I see, yeah. When you go for a run, you're taxing all your systems. You're just going out and doing an efficiency run. You're kind of hitting these different systems, whereas I separate all the systems down and I work them all individually. And then much later on, I start merging them together. So, you know, you go, okay, so he says, I've got to do hill whips. You know, you look at, uh, sorry, let me finish this first. So, so then much later on, I call it warm-up phase, uh, um, capacity building phase, which is separating them all down. And towards the end of that, I start merging them together. And then I call it a deficit phase, which is essentially, I break it all down. If I want to go and do my first fell run for six or seven miles, that's, you know, a fell run is quite hard if I included like 250 metres in, in a six-mile run. That, that potentially can be quite quite daunting and it can be quite hard on the legs but if I've started in the previous few weeks doing hill reps and all that lot then when I progress on to doing a fell run it's not going to be as hard if I do a fell run for 14 miles like the fan dance with weight on look at all the systems that are being taxed but what you need is you need to have the confidence uh, to, to know that you're okay you know you need to be working hard and go on that hill with weight on and go fine because if you start doing the, it's like I said in, in the previous uh, um, conversation we had about, you know, how uh, my, my boots rubbing. Well, you know, don't go out and just wear a pair of boots. You should be running one 500 meters in, in a pair of boots or walking around with them and then doing one mile and then doing two miles and then doing four miles and then doing 10 miles. And after a while, you just, you just do it, don't you? It's not about just lobbing it straight in there. And if you break your training down very specifically and then start to put it all together, you start taxing your body. And there is a lot of information, uh, sorry, not a lot of information, a lot of research that's been done recently. Um, and one of the guys that's part of it has got like a um, uh, quite a high acclaimed award. Uh, and one of them's got a Nobel Prize as well um, to suggest that there's three elements within our bodies and systems that um, normally are relatively dormant in, in, in people. And they've, um, a lot of research has proven that if you can stimulate these responses, this fight or flight or this defense mechanism, these elements fire off. And they, they suggest at the moment that it can contribute to maybe 14 extra years of life for a human being. And they've tested it in rats and other animals and stuff like that, and they've almost reversed the aging process. Now, that might, might not sound very interesting to some people, but certainly I want to live forever, but, but that's because they're recovering and they're recovering better. And when I looked at the research, it's exactly what I've been doing in my life overall which is shocking the body if you shock the body hard one of the elements so physical fitness but working at quite high level and shocking it hard will fire off one of the elements reduced amount of protein which if you're training hard most people would eat protein most days but if you reduce the amount of protein that you have not every day but quite often and and run and train on lack of protein it fires off another element because it's a flight of fight um, or flight response that your body has because it needs protein so that it goes right we've got to do this to to obviously com uh, compensate and the other one is um shocking the body with um things like hot cold lack of water lack of fuel and most people would say rightfully so to a certain extent you've got to fuel up, you've got to get the right sleep, don't go out when it's too hot, don't do this and all that. Do you know what I do? I do completely opposite of that. But I only do the opposite to that when my body's ready for it and I slowly start doing it. When, when the summer comes, I'm training in the midday sun with a bergen on and I've built up to that. And I'll sometimes train and I have put a bit of autophagy in there as in I don't eat anything after about seven o'clock at night and I don't eat until three or four o'clock in the afternoon, nothing. And I train twice or three times during that time as well. Yeah. So I'm firing off all of those responses in that fight or flight. And I always find that I always have a little bit of an edge on, on people generally because of the way that I train and I train people. And we certainly found that within the outdoor fitness. So I think there's something to be said about that. And people, when, when they come to elite outdoor fitness, they're normally training too hard. And I wind them back and say, look, you can achieve some great things but it's a journey. You want to enjoy the journey. She's just not going to be on it. Mm. You know, uh, most people just go and train for the sake of it like you and they're in that efficiency zone. They go, how can I get fitter, fitter with this? How can I do that? You can actually achieve anything. It's amazing. As you, as you well know, the body is absolutely amazing and it can, it can achieve great things, but we don't even tax it hard enough. People either tax it too hard too quickly. They've either got too much of a steeper um, training curve and they drop off the other end 
and just having a little bit of an understanding. Some people think, do you know what? I can't be asked for that. Just give me a training program and tell me, tell me what to do. And that is fair enough also. But if you have a little bit of a better, a better understanding on how the body works, it taps into the rest of everything else in your life. It makes you more balanced. So when your kids are not doing your editing, I mentioned the previous post, you'll be better balanced. Because if you train hard week by week by week, and this is another point that I was going to make about you, why sometimes you might be feeling tired. When do you deload? When do you have a week where it's fully reduced so that your body can catch up with a little bit? You probably don't. A few people asked me about three years ago, how can I get a part run? I'm on it. I'm, I can't get under 26 minutes. The other one was like about 20 and the other one was 18 because he was a lot younger. And I said, well, when's the last time you had a deload and a, a week's recovery? And I, never, I just train all the time. And I said, we'll have a week's deload, then a week's warm up and then go and race it again. And they all beat their times. So it's having a bit of an understanding, but why do you do that? You know, what's actually happening within your body? If you go and train hard now, when, when you go for your run, it probably doesn't happen as much with you. And that's why you're just ticking over. Your body straight away will release a lot of hormones. And certainly two hormones, and we discussed this before, is HGH and testosterone, which me and you, unfortunately, have got minimal amounts of in our body compared to an 18-year-old. But what you can do, which is why on eBay and all these different things, they look at me, I'm 56 years old and I look ripped as anything, is because they're training in a certain way and they're trying to sell that product. So we're going, shock your body, shock your central nervous system. The training that we do, I start to add that in a little bit so that you start to naturally build these normal hormones that help you recover. They make you live longer, they make your skin good. And it makes all that recovery kind of work for you. But if you keep training every single week, they drop off. And that's when people come off of their training and they say, oh, I've got a lot going on at home. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling a little bit down. Oh, I feel really nervous and anxious at the moment. Or I'm having fights with my kids or the, the wife and that. And normally, a week before, they said, oh, I'm flying my training. I'm loving it. I'm training really hard at the moment. And a week later, they drop off the other side. And that's why most people generally are on training, off training, on training, off training. So all you've got to do is understand how, at the level that you're training at, how many weeks are you going to get to that? And a week before, just put a deload in your training program, and then you will be consistent in your, in your um, movement forward. I see. So you almost hit like a, a, a wall of... You don't progress. You, you don't become efficient. It stops becoming efficient. If you yeah, you're, you're zapped, basically, and it starts to affect, actually negatively affect your mental health. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, it, it's, it's, lads do it all the time. They'll say to me, and we, women, we've got a lot of women as well, obviously, and they'll say, I am flying at the moment. I know they've been training after about two or three or four weeks, and it's all dependent. Everybody's different. And I'll go, right, need a deload. And they go, no, I'm fine at the moment. I go, no, no. And then they'll drop off the week later. It's, it's quite normal. And if you expect it, it's not a major drama. Else you'll just drop off. And the lads that go, no, no, I'm fine. They train on their own. And then maybe they're not part of one of the RTGs or personal training programs. And they're just doing their stuff on their own. They'll say, oh, I don't know what it is. I'm just lacking in so much motivation. Though. I just, I've lost thing. It's because you're probably overtraining. Because they're really fit and strong. They get personal best. But then, and it just drops off the other side. It's really important to make sure, you know, how can you keep individuals, for me, individual, group of individuals, Groups of people that pay me every month, it's not very expensive, but how can I engage them for years and years and years? Because that's what I do. You have to like invest in their motivation and their drive um, uh, to, to keep them participating all the time and wanting to do it. You know, I've got a few people at the moment and they're just starting and every week they're saying, I just love in the train and I can't wait for Mondays now because you want to... You want to set the seven-day period up so that they're taxing themselves over a period of time and making lots of efficiencies all individually, and they're moving forward. So they, it feeds that motivation, that drive. You must have felt it yourself. And when you, you get something, you give yourself a goal. There's so many kind of a bits of ammunition, and it, and it just changes people's lives because there's no greater feeling than being very capable. I'll give you an example of that, if you don't mind, and it's a bit of a strange one. But you know, my wife has said to me many times, what is, what is it with you? You're always in the monster, it, and things just happen to you. Like, for example, we were at Carfest a few years ago and the plane spanked in, bless him. Um, I was the first one on scene. You know, I had a pair of flip-flops on. It was, as a crow fly, just under a mile. And I think I did that in about four and a half, five minutes through woods in a pair of flip-flops. But um, nobody else turned up except for six army lads that were from an army, you know, they were showing all their army stuff on. It was only me that turned up and then a copper turned up about 20 minutes later and I... I told him what the script was and what was there and that the, the fact there were some explosives there from the seat that because he hadn't ejected. 
Um, so I'd say just just that was a bit quick. So it's a military aircraft crashed. Is that what you're saying? A civilian pilot, ex-military pilot. Um, yeah, he, he piled in to the wood line, unfortunately, about a mile away when I was at Carfest a few years ago. Right. But the point that I'm making is, you know, nobody, nobody responds to things like that because it was only me that responded and some army lads. No, kind of why is that? It's because people don't have the confidence. They don't feel that they're capable of doing something. You know, it was only me. And my, my wife was pregnant at the time as well. I just said, I'll meet with a, a so-so tent in an hour. If I'm not there, I'll meet back at the caravan. Um, and I took my day sack. And luckily for me, I had a med kit in there. And, uh, and I went. Not that it was used at all, but unfortunately. But uh, the point I'm making is it makes you more capable. And, and if you kind of do the right type of training, we've had a number of things, uh, people within Elite Outdoor Fitness now, that have responded to incidents, not as similar to that, but like the lad that flipped and piled in on the Brecon Beacons when he fell to the top of the fan, that rugby player. You know, Darren, one of our guys, responded to that. And I'm not saying that's down to elite outdoor fitness, but he did say that he felt more capable. He was strong in the hills. He had all the right kit, because that's what we do as well. It's about making sure that people are prepared so that if they are going out in the hills, if they're going for a fell run, or if they're going... For, for a long walk or whatever, you know, I can talk them through so they've got the right kit and they have a better understanding of maybe the fueling and the hydration that's needed. All the way up to, you know, we do Trident Adventure. I, I'm on the DS on uh, going to the Arctic, you know. I mentioned it before to you, you know, we, we lay down like a, and get in a bit of a huddle and people are kind of quite nervous and feeling vulnerable because they're so cold for an extended period of time. But it's about saying you are capable and you can do this. And at the end of like eight days doing an Arctic trip and going up on over the mountains, cross-country skiing, when they'd only learned five or six days before how to do it with 65 pound Bergens on, um, it changes them as, it, as people. And they all say it at the end of it, they say, I would never do anything like that. And I feel almost now that I could, I can take my um, son or daughter out in the hills and I'm more ready and prepared. And I feel like I could, be exposed to the elements a little bit more and have a clear understanding of what my boundaries are. And that starts, I sent a post up the other day, that starts by doing 400 efforts. Because at the end of 400 efforts, a one 400 effort, you're piling in and your heart rate's going up and you feel like you have to stop. And, but just by increasing those, that type of training, but so that it's achievable, not so that it's really hard all the time, changes you and it allows you then to tap into an area that most people just don't don't get chance to tap into because they're not training the right way and it doesn't have to be hard when you're tapping into those higher zones you're ready you're ready to and you'll enjoy it as well got you nick where can people get hold of you obviously we're going to put all your links below our below our podcast but um yeah, so just uh, Google Elite Outdoor Fitness. I think there's a place in New Zealand or Australia that does the same, but we're top searchers and all that lot. Elite Outdoor Fitness. I talk to every single person if they want to. So if anybody wants to come and say, look, you know, I don't know where to start my training or I'm a bit of a ninja of the hills, but I'd like to become faster or I want to include weights so I can do some of these weighted stuff because they're, they're really enjoyable and challenging, you know, and, and if you get involved in that type of stuff, you know you're hitting all the components of physical fitness. Then... Just give us a shout and I can like uh, establish what your maximum heart rate is uh, and help you out, even if it's just that alone. You know, I'm more than happy to help people. I started my company not to, to run it as a business for money as such, although obviously it is doing. Um, we're trying to make it cheaper and cheaper all the time. The more people we get, the cheaper it will get because I want to provide something for people and say, look, you know, fitness is, is not art, but it is when you don't know what to do. Um, and people just need a bit of help to keep that motivation going. And, and make it part of their life. There's no point being fit for three months. You want to be fit consistently at the right level for years and years and years, because that is a game changer. And that's what makes you more balanced and healthier, because we all want to live longer and we all want to be more, more balanced and enjoy our time with our family instead of being stressed out all the time. So yeah, come to Elite Outdoor Fitness. You've got loads of different types of training. We've got fitness days. We've got the tier test. It's a bit hidden a little bit that, but it's a, a tier test that goes from um, the that kind of takes you through a number of SF stuff if you want to do that much later, because it goes from yellow to uh, green to blue to maroon to sandy to black. Uh, I think there's only about five people that are on the sandy this year, actually, because it's quite unique, and you would need to pass all of those before you go up. And all it does, really, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It's like virtual tests, um, and it allows you to start to tap into the areas, and we help you do that so that you're 
hitting all the components, physical fitness, everything we've discussed tonight, from speed work, with weighted fitness, strength conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we've got personal training, but I don't do a lot of that. It's normally for people that really need that extra bit of help. And we've got the RTG groups as well. We've got a number of those. We've got uh, Speedy, an international runner. We've got Duncan, who's excellent at forces and, and, uh, and runs the baseline one. You've got me and I run the events one. So whether you start running for the first time or cycling or, or whatever, or doing CrossFit, there's a place for everybody. And you get a one-to-one -one interaction every day by, by a coach like myself. So, you know, personally, and I know I'm biased, I think it's a great opportunity for people to come and get, and get fit. And we've proven it as well. You know, this year, I've run Paris 10. I won the Commando Shuffle and the Fan Dance this year. I've run plenty of triathlons, 5Ks, 10Ks. It's not about that, but the training works. It's about getting it right. And so why spend an hours and hours a week training when you can come to us? It doesn't cost a lot of money. We have a great community. We're always training together in that, and it's just getting bigger and bigger. Sounds brilliant. Friends at home, you heard it here first. Get involved. Which, which um, areas... Do you operate in, Nick? Everywhere. We've got Chiltern, Zeeland Valley, Brecon Beacons, Worcestershire, um, up north a little bit. Uh, we, we go to all the Paris 10s and the Commander Shuffles, and we have kind of lots of socials in that respect as well. We do lots of team events. Next year, we're kind of focusing on doing a lot of our own events as well. I've got two lads, it's SF lad as well, who also works for Avalanche, uh, Stu, and, uh, and one of the others to kind of facilitate, kind of building up some really unique kind of... Um, Are you just for specific events as well and fitness days. Are you doing online coaching for people as well if they if they're so remote? Most of it's all online. We do fitness days as well all around the country, but most ninety percent of it's all online. So we've got you. You come online. Go right, Nick. I just want to get fit. I look. I look at you. I work all your stats out. Okay, you've never done any training before, or you just you can run a maximum of three or four miles or whatever. Um, we'll reduce it down so it's nice and capable and easy for you. Um, put your on to RTG, you chat to everybody else that's on that RTG, you're part of a community of people that are giving you information about events and kits and all that lot, and you've got a document, and I give you a training programme that everybody's filling out, so you can see everybody else's 400s, their stats, and then every week I go through it and say, look, you're, you're a little bit inconsistent with your 400s or your 800s or this, that, and the other, or you need to invest a little bit more in the hill reps, you could do a bit more, or reduce your training and we're having a deload this week, etc., etc. Like at the moment, on the RTG event, we're into the last couple of weeks before Christmas for the fan dance. And what you'll see on the fan dance is probably the top 15, 20 people. Most of them will be from Elite Outdoor Fitness. And it's not right. that that type of person is because they've allowed themselves to engage in something that gets them fitter and stronger. And it's a nice journey as well. It doesn't have to be too hard. Sounds ideal. Friends, you heard it. Like I say, get involved. Send Nick an email and... Um... Yeah, uh, only good can come of it, can't it? Nick, thanks ever so much again. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think this will be the last of our, our chats by any means. And folks, if you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.